computer. Hey, it's Mazzy here again, and um, it's great to have Jason Jones, uh, Rhino Records, back with us. Last time we talked about one of my favorite groups of the 1970s, of course, Little Feet. Uh, he worked mm. on uh, those reissues, is still working on those. And we're talking about the replacements today. He's been working on this series of reissues, expanded reissues, remixes. And um, we're going to really kind of concentrate on Tim, the box set that came out. But we'll talk about more replacements beyond that. And mm -hmm. uh, before Jason jumps in, I'm going to get a little background on my my thing. I'm the I'm the generation of that. I, I saw Jason. Uh, I read some of your contributions in the Hoffman forums and mm. some of the comments. And some person says something about you know the boomers don't get this. And I was thinking about that because I'm a boomer, <laughs> but I realized except for um, Tommy. The entire band are boomers. They're all actually boomers. I'm five years older than Correct. Westerberg. But um, in 1981, I dated a woman who lived in Minneapolis, and I would go visit her. And I remember, must have been late that year or early 92, I couldn't. We went to a record store together. I bought this. Cool. Because I just started hearing about that. And we get into college radio, which yeah. really was a... a, 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 a bringing this kind, these kind of bands, you know, Husker mm -hmm. Du, this band's, uh, you know, post-punk and everything, and whatever we want to call this, proto-grunge mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, alternative. But my, the girl I was dating bought mm -hmm. Face Value by um, Phil Collins. Oh. And got back to her place, and that's all she'd play. I put this on for her. She couldn't handle it. One of the times I was there, I saw that they were playing, and I wish I could remember what club it was or what date, and I don't. Sure. And she didn't want to go see them. So I didn't see them then. But mm -hmm. I did look up. I first saw them at October 30th, 1984, at the I-Beam, which is oh. on Eighth Street in San Francisco. And um, that actually was a good show. And we can get into the good and bad of their live performances. It was a, were, there, were there a lot of were there a lot of covers that night or was it pretty well, much it's, original? There were, before? but the only cover I remember that was out of the box, I thought at the time was Light My Fire. They did like <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah so uh you know light my the replacements doing light my fire yeah Cut, and that's right after let it be came, that was like the month mm -hmm. after let it be came out i think yeah and i love that's probably my favorite but we can get into that and then the a year later i saw them on december december 11th at a smaller club called berkeley square okay. in, in berkeley on the bill was the american music club okay and they weren't very good that night. I don't remember the covers, but this was like after Tim came out. So sure. they were a bit, and that was a smaller club, bit of a shit show. So that's where I come in. I won't say I have been all in on the pretenders, although I did buy their records. Replacements, not pretenders. God. Sire <laughs> Records. Well, I'm in the Sire family. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. Correct me if I do that. I have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. But I had a friend that worked at Warner Brothers in the 80s. And this is the copy he gave me, of course, with the nice uh, Warner. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My promo of Tim. And I love this record. And we mm -hmm. can get in about the mix and the reverb and uh, mm -hmm. how uh, Tommy, is it Erdeli? Is that how he's called? Erdeli. Erdeli. Of course, mm -hmm. he'll always be Tommy Ramon. Sure, yeah, yeah. All of us. And how that came out and how you and uh, Bob Mayer, the author mm -hmm. of Trouble Boy, really mm -hmm. compiled this package as i as yeah. i read it. is that correct yeah, oh, yeah, yeah yeah okay now it's for you to it talk took us it took us like i mean we worked on the box for over 18 months so it was you know took a lot of <laughs> took a lot of work um but you've been doing the other there's four of them prior oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i can i came on board uh, actually, the very first project that was assigned to me at Rhino, whenever I joined in January of 2019, was Dead Man's Pop. So I, that you know, Replacements are one of my favorite bands of all time. So I thought that it was a very, you know, it was a good omen uh, that on my very first day at Rhino, that that is what I was assigned my boss at the time looked at me and said, do you like the replacements? And I was like, well, of course. Um, you know, I've loved that band since I, I was, I've loved that band since I was 11 years old. Uh, and I remember driving around, uh, riding in the back seat of my sister's car, 
Um, I'm from Tennessee, so there was a alternative station in Nashville called Thunder 94. It was 94.1 FM. Uh, this would have been 1993. Um, I'm born in 82. Um, and I remember hearing uh, I'll Be You on the in the speakers in the back but my grandmother was in the front passenger seat and my sister and my grandmother were talking to each other so i really couldn't hear you know i could hear bits and you know snatches of this song um but the dj whenever he came on all he said is and that was the replacements didn't say the name of the song or anything so this is pre-internet age so i just kind of went through the rabbit hole of buying every single replacements record trying to find this one song now, over the course of buying the catalog, you know, my first replacements record was Tim, because that was the one that I could find at my, you know, on the next uh, journey that uh, my family would take to Nashville so that I could go to uh, a chain called Media Play. This would, uh, have been and, this would have been a CD. Yeah, yeah, it's a CD era. So, you know, I was listening to the original 87 uh, issue of it on CD. Um I loved it, you know, but I was still searching for that song. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that two of the main, you know, two of the major kind of revision, revisionist projects that I've been associated with and co-produced for the replacements are kind of tied to those first, um, you know, introductions to the band whenever I was, you know, 11 years old. So um, it's, you know, it, I've done Dead Man's, I did Dead Man's Pop with Bob Mayer. We did Please to Meet Me uh, short, uh, the next year, um, again, co-produced with Bob Mayer. Um, and then for the 40th anniversary of Sorry Ma, we did a massive 100-track uh, box set for that. Then afterwards, you know, we took a break um, because we, we knew that the projects that were the first three projects, those are the ones where we had the most readily accessible uh outtake and bonus material um you know with advanced pop we had all of the bearsville sessions we had you know a, a, a line share of outtakes that we could choose from um from the la sessions with matt wallace we had um a live show you know what what was released as the incarcerated ep you know, we had the full show for that. So, you know, it was just a really nice, robust package, plus the remix that Matt Wallace did, uh, which is based off of the original notes that he and Paul Westerberg uh, collaborated on, on actually the very, the last two days of uh, the sessions for uh, what became Don't Tell a Soul. So um, that was great. Please meet me. You know, that was, I love that box. But it was also one that was created in the midst of the pandemic. So we were kind of limited in what we could access just because of protocols, safety protocols at that time. That's part of the reason why there's no live show in that box. Oh, okay. Uh, because we just couldn't get access to the tapes or what tapes we could potentially get access to in enough time. Like from it was the vaults or from well, the just just from just from sound people. At the time, who worked with the band, you know, we were going through. Not from in the Warner vaults. No, no, no. That's there's only there's only a a very there's a few live shows in the Warner vault, right? But they did not professionally record the band during the Please to Meet Me era because of the live recording that they had already done. That was the Maxwell's show that was released in 2017. Um, yeah, a great, great. You record. did this right. Uh, no, I did not do that oh, one. That's that's primary. Right. That's that's pretty much Bob on that one. Got it. Uh, Bob this is Merrill great. This is great, by the way. Yeah, it's a great. It's a it's an amazing live show. Um, this record was this record store day? I think it was. No, it was it was a general retail release. Yeah, I don't remember now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a two LP and a two CD. Is this still it's in print? Do you know? Um, I don't believe so. I think it's out look, of print. Look for it. Discogs, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Because it's a, it's, it really is. It's one of the best live records. <laughs> now, um, while you're um, getting into this, how, sure. how easy or how um open were the members, the living members, well, the members of the band mm -hmm. uh, 
to get you things or to be a part of this? What was their reaction to all this? I mean, I mean, with with Maxwell's, that was no all of them, was this a, entire series. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Well, I'll kind of give you the okay breakdown of everything. With Maxwell's, that was kind of a test run to see if there was any kind of interest in archival releases from the replacements. And they did really, really well. Um, by the time, you know, I came on board in 2019, you know, they were looking to do something a bit more ambitious with Dead Man's Pop. Um, the band, you know, Paul and Tommy both, you know, listened to those, listened to Matt Wallace's remix of it. You know, we had to get a lot of things cleared and okayed. Uh, you know, the Tom Waits portion of Dead Man's Pop to where there's a chunk of the session that they did together uh, that resulted in the B-side date to church. Um, you know, there's a lot of that uh, that I had to go through. We had all those tapes in the vault, but, you know, there's there's just a lot of banter and we wanted to make sure everything was cool from the replacement side and also the Tom Waits side. So, you know, they've been... They have been actively involved. However, they've also kind of let us just kind of get on with it, you know, but they do, they do have, you know, we ultimately seek their approval on pretty much everything. Uh, there's a situation where there's new uh, compositions involved, um, not just alternate takes of pre-existing compositions. So no, no, they're, they're, they're involved. They, they are involved. Now, are they, you know, are they saying, bring the guitar up here, you know, uh, bring the vocal down here, like all that kind of stuff? I mean, not really, but, you know, there was more on the Dead Man's Pop uh, project where that kind of feedback would come in. But pretty much, you know, they they trust us and they know that, you know, we're doing a good job. So kind of let us just kind of do, you know, do, do what we do. However, you know, no, they are, they have to approve everything. You know, it's, it's, it's essential. You know, yeah. we do, we do it through their management. Paul has a manager, Tommy has a manager. Uh, they've been, they've been crucial um, in getting everything over the line for these releases. And Chris and Sally probably Chris, Chris and Sally. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and whenever there's stuff with Slim, you know, we, we, we go down the path of seeking uh, the Dunlap's approval as well. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's just, we, we want to make sure that everyone's happy with what it is that we're, that we're doing because there's not a lot of bands from that time period who are really getting this kind of deep dive into their discographies, you know, and with, and with such, you know, quality over quantity, you know, we want to make sure that we are really living up to the high bar that we have set with each of these box sets. And I, I will say, you know, with the Dead Man's Pop bar was pretty high. The Please Meet Me bar is high as well. Sorry Ma bar is very high. You know, we've set the bar even higher with this new Tim box. So, you know, that'll that'll kind of <laughs> directly <laughs> impact what it is that we're looking to do um, in the future, hopefully. But, it you know, we, we got to look at this as one at a time. You mm -hmm. know, we got to make sure that the response, not just critically, but also from a sales perspective, is there to you know warrant us continuing to do it well i was uh, <clears throat> since i hadn't followed along with some of these reissues and I, mm. I made a comment somewhere and someone corrected me or, or enlightened me that i i didn't realize that these had been re the early twin tone had been released through sire and picked up for sire and that leads me well no they're um the twin tone the twin tone releases are they're still twin tone However, from a content acquisition uh, perspective, um, Twin Tone did a deal with a label called Restless, who were distributed through, who were associated with Ryko Disc. Rhino purchased Ryko Disc. 
So as a part of the perpetual kind of license of the Twin Tone catalog, we now have the full replacements catalog, not just the Sire catalog, but also the Twin Tone uh, catalog through Rhino. So we're able that to- That means we might get an expanded- I mean, maybe, you know, maybe. I mean, I think- You have that, no that, idea, do you? <laughs> well, I think that we're looking, again, we, we're we looking at these one at a time, you know, okay. and the the box sets that came first before we took the break again like those were the ones with that had the most stuff that was readily accessible you know and with 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 the twin tone era uh with the sorry mall project you know peter jesperson also produced that box with myself and bob Mayer, and his his contributions were you know immense uh for that box so you know all the liner we, notes. We, are these uh, bob, liner bob, notes? Mayer, bob Mayer does all the liner notes he's you know are they from his book or are they newly written or the combination uh they're i mean they're informed by what was in trouble boys but pretty much it's, all I mean, those of you who i mean this is a massive book i you know there are people who watch these things say mazzy you're a shill for these record companies you're doing this when i love something the only reason i i do this or the or the uh, Little Feet. I'm not a critic. I've never. Been, I'm a fan of music sure. and bands and and packaging, and you know the whole historic thing of this, and obviously Sire Records and Seymour Sign and the the sure. infamous stories of how great they could be one night and how like what a shit show they could be on another night. It what what I want to talk about as we get mm. into this. But going back, it seems like in the last decade of fifteen years, maybe more. Uh, they've sort of been reevaluated by other people. Of course, a lot of bands, uh, the whole grunge scene in the in the with you know with Pearl Jam and and um, uh, Nevermind, but you know the, mm -hmm. the bands, the Seattle sound, the Seattle grunge, sure. were very influenced by this stuff and actually took it to a level that actually sold records and they weren't as much of a, a shit show. I mean, even mm -hmm. Husker Du wasn't a huge seller. Obviously, they were picked up by Warner Brothers too, and mm -hmm. they had a tightness consistently live in their performances and professional, mm. unlike uh, the replacements. But it seems like there's been a reevaluation, obviously songs in, in, in soundtracks and, uh, you know, uh, even since going back to maybe singles when that came out with Paul Westerbrook putting that together. Sure. I mean, think I think, that? I think that there's, they've had the good fortune of not just being reevaluated, uh, Critically, you know, I think uh, Bob Bob's book uh, did a a world of good towards re towards a, a, a overall reevaluation of that band. Also, discovery versus streaming, discovery via cover versions uh, that have happened over the last few years. You know, there's a reason why Swingin' Party is the and uh, Lord do a cover string song. Lord did a cover. There's a band called Kindness that also did a cover. You know, it's just it's there's certain there's and also Androgynous being a song that was covered by you know multiple people. You know, Joan Jett, Miley Cyrus. You know, there's there's a, a lot of um, you know, Lord Jane Grace, you know, there, there's a lot of people who have, you know, helped in the reevaluation of, of this band. So I think that there's, there's just been, you know, it's just been building. It's just been building over the years. And I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to play the part that I'm able to play in trying to do this because i'm again like i'm just a steward for this great art that you know that these brilliant musicians and brilliant songwriters created you know so many years ago and it was college radio we i mentioned that a little bit at the beginning because in the early 80s i'm me being from san francisco kusf was a major uh college radio station obviously mm -hmm. Every college area had their version. We were fortunate enough to have two people uh, had a, a, that really kind of helped in the college who weren't college students at all. But it was a guy named um, Chris Nab who owned Aquarius Records, and mm. you probably know of Howie Klein, who became oh, okay. 
how he climbed yeah. to the show. And he started 415 Records sure. in San Francisco. And then, of course, later he would be the, what, the president of Sire um, or work. Yeah, with yeah, yeah. He, was, he was he was a big wig at Warner for a number of years. Exactly. And he produ- he brought these bands to like all pe- to people like me, even though the bands that I was getting into more at the time were uh, like Echo and the Bunny Man and the Furs and um, the mm. British bands, the Joy Division and stuff. I was going, sure. I was into the those, and then hearing these was very different in a way because mm. it goes back to garage rock, really. And mm. it was there was a a semi organized sloppiness, maybe you could call it, but it was well, there, there, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of punk rock DIY ethics that's there, but also you know, they are also students of what you would call now classic rock radio, you know, 70s FM radio, uh, 70s AM radio, you know, I mean, just look at some of the covers that they did, you know, they did everything from the Green Acres theme to uh, Yummy, Yummy, Yummy to Ace of Spades, Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, they, they, they really, in in a similar way that NRBQ kind of had the, right, right, we'll just, you scream it out we'll try it you know i think that they also had that they also had that swagger to be able to want to do stuff like that alongside their own you know brilliant compositions let's go through this set um since sure. this is a good time to go through the set now of course i got this and there's when this came out, I really liked it, and I'm not. Mm. I was not adverse to the quote, the sound of it, the slickness, the reverb drenched sound. Sure. Obviously, now when you hear this remix, you go, "Oh my God, what were they thinking then?" <laughs> but I didn't sure. like. I didn't mind it, and I'm one, maybe the few people that actually liked Robert Longo's cover art, and I like that mm. some of these indie bands. Um, good example was Gerhard Richter's uh, Modernist stuff that sonic youth used back in the late sure. 80s covers but this now, now the longo i will say the longo cover that's something to where they really there's two reasons for that you know i think that ultimately sire had an eye towards seeing if the band could get along with longo because they wanted longo to direct a video for the band now they did get along but the band's kind of uh, reticence uh slam also dis- disdain uh for the music video format kind of made it so that it was it's kind of a lost exercise now long ago i will say not to draw comparisons between them and their uh southern uh brethren rem you know longo directed the one i love video yeah. so that's you know uh, it just just thinking you know you can compare for, those who, for those who don't know who are watching robert longo is part of the downtown art scene in the 80s but he mm. got famous for these large full-size drawing pencil drawings that were outlines of people falling if you ever saw the beginning yeah. of the tv show mad men that was based on longo uh art pieces he's kind of people with their ties up and everything. There's a really great uh, illustration that he did for a Glenn Bronca record um, that has that kind of uh, falling, falling, you know, uh, depiction in it. And you include it on the back, you included a Moisha Bronca picture on the front. Yeah. But which is, which that, which that front cover photo, you know, I, he, he, photographed famously the cover for Ramones Leave Home, which was the very first project that Tommy Ramone and Ed Stasium ever worked on together. And it's kind of funny that, and funny cosmically, you know, in the sense that kind of a lot of the work that we were doing was really a much larger than cosmically, uh, than what we than what we knew we were getting into you know this is this is you know this is the final project that tommy and ed had been able to work on you know and okay. in, in this way because of tommy's passing in the early 2000s right so you got, so, you got um yeah five discs the one lp and four mm-hmm. cds a hybrid concept some yeah. people love some people have a why can't it be all cds why can't it be all vinyl 
Uh, let's let's get into that a little bit because sure. some I have to buy the vinyl when I don't have a record player and vice versa. Sure. Well, I will say, you know, we've set a precedent with the previous packages that we put together for the band. You know, they have been the mixed media format. Uh, you know, it's 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 a format in which we can still give high quality, give you a high quality product. Uh, with the nice wraps that we have, with a very robust booklet, with, you know, very, very nice vinyl, you know, that the vinyl's cut by Chris Bellman on that. Uh, and also a really great remastering done by Justin Perkins at Mystery Room Mastering. But, you know, they've, we want to make sure that we can give you quality while also not trying to break your, your bank account you know I mean, this is you can get this for you know it's supposed to retail for you know 89 dollars so getting four cds plus a lp plus a really robust booklet you know with with you know bob's great commentary and um all you know previously unreleased photographs you know it's it's it really is kind of a bang for your buck thing now if we were going to do an lp version of this you know you're looking at likely seven lps plus you know if we're even going to go down that route you know we would look to include seven inches plus if we're going to do a very nice booklet you know you're looking at something that's going to cost a lot you know a lot more than i think people recognize that <laughs> that it would cost i you know have you're the, looking, you're I, looking I at have, something that's probably going to be like 250 oh at least i have uh, the big a uh, huge lp uh signs of the times prince box set and sure. the and the iggy pot or the stooges one too so yeah. i yeah. totally know so the okay the lp is the new uh Ed 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 Sims mix yeah. i heard that and i thought you know i'm not a big fan of remixes Usually, I'm not a huge. I'm as a Beatle collector, Beatle fan. I'm I go hot and cold, piece by piece, with uh, Beatle remixes. Uh, mm -hmm. Horn. I was bowled away by this because it it was is a tighter, less drenched in reverb. The drums, the bass, and even the vocals, and even the background. I mean, everything. Not that everything was pushed up because it's it's very well balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that and. And when you guys got it and how the band react to that, did they comment? Because it, well, it, I, it, it blew me away. And I blew well, Sure. Work work on the project really started after the release of the Sorry Ma project. Um, because I knew that, well, we just wanted to see if it was even possible. Because the, whenever we finally got a hold of the multi-tracks, uh, from the vault, you know, the the worry that I had whenever we whenever I went in to listen to everything was that the reverb would be baked into the multi, you know, that we wouldn't have clean sounds for the drums and for the bass and for the guitar and, you know, all the other elements that were there. And whenever we threw everything up and actually started listening to everything, I was it was it was like a Christmas morning uh, moment to where it's like, OK, this this has some legs to it. You know, and Bob and I had already been talking about getting Ed involved because, you know, ultimately he was originally supposed to be associated with Tim, you know, but his scheduling just didn't work out for him to do it. Because he, he was engineered on a lot of projects. He, he on the Ramones. He engineered with Tommy on the Ramones album. Yes, yes, he did. He did, and that's you know the the. I think whenever the band decided to go with Tommy, I think that they thought that Ed would just come along as part of the package, but ultimately it didn't work out, and they worked with uh, their. Uh, previous engineer uh, at Twin Tone, uh, they worked at Nicolette's studio in Minneapolis. So it was kind of a, it was a situation where Tommy's working in a studio that he hasn't really worked in before. You know, they did a, they did a, a very brief 
demo session where they cut two songs, which you'll find on CD three of the box, uh, Kiss Me on the Bus and Little Mascara, the studio demos of that. Um, but that was kind of the, the that was the initial like voyage to Nicolette for them to work together. Um, so it was, you know, it was it was an exercise that ultimately ended up with the sound of what you hear on Tim. Now, um, Tommy Stinson has said that, you know, Tommy Ramone mixed it in headphones, you know, which that is, that's up for debate. You know, Tommy Ramone, whenever he's been, whenever he was interviewed about it, he refuted it. But Tommy, oh, Tommy Stinson uh, remembers any time that he saw Tommy Ramone in the control room, he had headphones on. So I think that that speaks to kind of the unique way uh, in which it was mixed. And also, you know, the studio uh, kind of gadgets and uh, tricks at the time, you know, they really wanted to, yeah, it's a, that's a photo of them in 77, almost 78. Um, but it was, you know, that's where the digital reverb comes in. And also, you know, I think with with Ed's mix, <clears throat> we we ultimately wanted him to stay as true to the original as possible. You know, not lose any of the elements that are there. And whenever we started like picking it, picking the multi tracks apart and a being them against the original mix, you know, there's a lot of things that you hear in the new mix that are actually there in the old mix. They're just kind of buried in that, like... You just don't notice them, right? You right. just don't yeah. notice them as much. When you, you go know, back... Every, like, every, everyone yeah. was talking, everyone was talking about whenever the whenever we released Left of the Dial as the first kind of track from the box, that, you know, there's, uh, there's moments in the outro where you hear Paul kind of humming along with himself. You can actually hear that on the original 85 mix it's just it's just very buried now i i i immediately picked it out because i've heard i had heard the stasium mix so much uh that by the time i whenever we heard the remaster i was like oh that that's been there the whole time you and know I it's just it more things like I that after the LP, you have the CD of the Stasium mix. That's mm -hmm. what you have. And then yes. you have a CD of a remastered of the original. And when I went back and heard that, mm -hmm. I heard some of those things after hearing sure. the thing. Yeah. And uh, so which, you got which, CD. which with the new remaster, you know, I mean, all of all of this, all the contents of the box are mastered by Justin Perkins at Mystery Room Mastering, who's done an amazing job on all of the previous box sets that we've we, that we've put together now with this with the remaster of the original mix you know we really kind of we wanted to do an a, an improvement upon what came out in 2008 uh whenever the first uh, attempt at uh expanding the catalog um whenever that took place because in the 2008 remastered you know there was a lot of elements that were you know, taken out of that um of that remaster you know like the most egregious one for me was the uh removal of paul saying okay at the very beginning of left of the dial which to me that is such an integral part of that song and kind of the the drama within that song so, you know, it's just like stuff like that that we wanted to do. We really, we really wanted to, um, we really just wanted to improve upon the previous mastering of, of that record, you know, and also we, you know, this is, this, this box set is not, is not intended to replace the original mix. You know, it's, it's not, that's why we included the original mix. You know, it's it's different than like Dead Man's Pop, to where we were really trying to recontextualize the dead, the Don't Tell a Soul era, and what happened with uh, Don't Tell a Soul as an album. Uh, with Tim, you know, we know that a lot of people know, love, adore that original mix. 
So that's that's the reason why we have both. You know, and I've seen people picking their favorites from the Stasium mix and their favorites from the new remaster and kind of creating their own new version of Tim. And that's the kind of dialogue and discourse uh, that, you know, we really kind of wanted to happen uh, in putting this out, you know. And, it was and smart frankly, having both of them included here on, yeah. the, on compact disc, at least. Sure. And go into the, uh, the outtakes. Um, sure. And I know around this time, was it, uh, or just before this is when uh, Alex Chilton was recorded some. Uh, so time. Alex, there, were, there was an initial uh, recording session that took place in January of 1985 uh, with Alex Chilton, you know, that yielded the ultimately released version of Left of the Dial that's on Tim um, and also the track Nowhere Is My Home that was released on the UK compilation uh, Boink. Um that was put out by uh, Glass Records uh, around the time that they were about to do a, a European tour. Um, so those two songs were what was what were released at the time uh, from those sessions. And in the 2008 uh, release, uh, there was uh, the electric version of "Can't Hardly Wait" that was released. Those are and my also favorite. and and the um, air shaft acoustic demo version of can't hardly wait and there's uh, a cello but, we, but we found the whole session we found the complete session and and the multi-tracks from those sessions so you know with the tracks like nowhere is my home with the alternate version of both of the alternate versions of can't hardly wait um not More the version. acoustic not the acoustic demo version we kept that the same because we were like we can't there's no reason to improve upon that track because it's perfect as is. Um, but the um, Nowhere's My Home, both versions, the electric demo of Can't Hardly Wait, the uh, the cello version of I love the cello Can't version. Wait. Yeah, yeah. No, I wonder if they liked it. Did an amazing job. I know Paul was into the Beatles and that whole thing, and he wanted to mix the the grunge or what they didn't even call it grunge, whatever you know, garage stuff uh, with the Beatle with with hooks and and power pop hooks a little bit but he was into some pretty like uh, sugary songs those guys too so the cello yeah, version, i mean Paul, i thought it was kind of cool no i i think it's it's amazing i mean he he when he was leaving the session the previous day's session he uh went to the receptionist at nicolette who he knew could play cello and said hey bring your cello tomorrow uh and on the on the multi-track recording you can hear paul standing in the room like, giving her direction of okay the, okay you're going to this note you're going to this note you know stuff like that um so you know i, I can't hardly wait is a song that it was recorded it was originally uh written in 1984 uh kind of right after let it be sessions were completed you know they played it throughout that tour you know, it's a song that actually the root, the 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 lore is that whenever Seymour Stein saw them at the Ritz at the show that ultimately led to them being signed to Sire, that can't hardly wait was the song that he was like, "That's a hit. We got. I got to sign this band." That and it's band. funny that that song didn't even end up being on Tim, but you can see so many. The fits and starts of them trying, you know, retrying and retrying that song over the course of, you know, about a year because between the acoustic demo version, the electric demo version, the cello version, and also the version that was cut during the Tim, the actual Tim sessions, which is further uh, down in the CD3, you know, it's it, it was a song that he was kind of ultimately you know revisiting and you know and they played it throughout the tim tour and ultimately it, it was recorded uh with the horn section um it's kind of like a box tops uh tribute um, for please to meet me are there any were there any surprises i mean when you get these multi-tracks and you get the tapes from iron mountain wherever you get them from um do you see the list before and of the track list or do you have to wait till you see the tapes? I know they, a lot of times they'll send you kind of, uh, you know, skews or whatever photos of the tape boxes, I guess. 
Were there surprises? Yeah, we get we get to take boxes. We get we you know we want to know what we're getting into. Surprises so, yeah, no, when you I listen. knew I knew the complete contents of the tapes before I actually started listening to the multi tracks, and you know I I could see that okay and tracking sheets so i knew okay there's there's you know three attempts at vocal on this track there's this many guitar tracks you know that's that's you know yeah i knew all that stuff but well, again you, it was it was the fear was that the reverb was baked into the master well, and my, track master that's but, it, but it was not what my one of my favorite albums of all time is realistic pillow recorded at rca you know mm -hmm. an airplane sure. and the reverb is so baked in that and it's so unfortunate because it's a great album, and but it's mm -hmm. got that reverb. Even MoFi did a version of it, and it sounds better than the originals. But that, if they could just dry that record up a little bit, I, I'm. But obviously, sure. I mean, maybe with uh, you know the New Zealand uh, technology they have there, mm -hmm. uh, they used on Get Back, they could do something. But yeah, maybe, maybe we don't want it though, right? Yeah, but um, but no, there there were you know a lot of the alternate versions that um, ultimately released on cd3 you know those the you know hearing the alternate vocals to songs like bastards of young hearing the alternate intro where he's doing you know the military hut 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 intro over the iconic scream you know just the different different guitar licks and hold my life um and also the a really beautiful kind of like acoustic live in studio version of swing and party you know, there's there there's just a lot of really fun stuff, and also you know, in a previously unreleased Tommy Stinson composition called "Having Fun" that was sung by Paul Westerberg. Right. Um, you know, there were there were a few things that we had to leave on the cutting room floor. You know, they attempted a version of "I Want to Destroy You" by the Soft Boys during that uh, during the recording sessions, but they were sung by uh, their roadie. Um, so they did. They were like over. They did so many covers live, and sometimes yeah, it re yeah. re ruined it. Would do a whole, almost virtually a whole set of covers yeah. sometimes. And during the Alex Chilton sessions, there's a version of "Heart of Stone" or like a half-hearted attempt at "Heart of Stone" uh, that we just couldn't, we just couldn't salvage. You know, I think that there's again, it, it speaks to the we want quality over quantity, and we're we're fortunate and blessed that we do have a large quality. Uh, quantity of quality tracks to include on on these box sets now on the last disc why did you and how did you uh, decide to include uh this uh january 11 6, 86 track in um in chicago i will note they there's the beetle connection there because they cover nowhere man but oh, yeah, uh, yeah. tell me about that which is a, a bizarre version but still it's it's, it's a soundboard recording it's recorded by the sound man at the time um you know, was it a choice of live shows or this was it? That was pretty much it. You know, I think that for things that are well recorded uh, and that are up to the same standard of what we want to put out. You know, I think that that's, you know, there was a soundboard recording that was issued on the Sorry Ma box. Um, you know, we're able to, we're able to work with with what tapes we have access to you know and there's there's a really rich community uh still vibrant community of people who are still who are so who were associated with the band at the time who have been invaluable in their time and energy and support and contributions uh to these box sets so that's that's the reason why we've got why we've got the the live show that's that's associated with this because again you know there's there's only a handful of professionally recorded shows that we have in the vault uh from the band um from their time at sire okay so let's so, and it's and it's a great it's a great it's a great recording you know it's it's one where it's not so covers heavy you know then the covers that they did do are very tastefully done and pretty much complete uh rather than you know them doing the you know minute or 90 second kind of attempts at some of the covers you know there they, there's an amazing version of you know trouble boys a, a great great version of jumping jack flash uh borstal breakout by shame 69 you know uh, bob stinson does the vocal on their cover of the crusher 
uh, by the Novas. You know, hitching it's hitching a it's, ride. It, yeah, yeah, and and hitching. Well, it's hitching a ride into taking a ride, which yeah. I think is hilarious. Uh, but I, you know, it's all of the rarity associated with it, and and Bob Stinson having the lead vocal, uh, which was a, a very rare thing to happen. You know, I think that that you know, it just whenever we start digging into these kinds of boxes, you know, the more that we dig, the more that we reach out, the more that we're able to find, you know, they really kind of build themselves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, 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 it's amazing to be able to work on a discography of a band as important as the replacements, you know, they, they, really this... are, they really are one of, the great bands when i got this friday i you know i was kind of excited and kind of like okay i you know so many records come through here and i my own collection but i put on the remix on the vinyl i um i didn't listen to the cd but mm -hmm. i listened to everything else on cd i didn't listen sure. to the uh, uh ed station remix stasium remix but i blasted it up here in my main room and i just all i wanted to do that weekend is pl and i went and pulled all my re replacement records and Good. i had because I hadn't played, you know how we get into, you get in the mood of a band like Little Feet sure. up through three months of Little Feet playing everything. Oh, dude, I'm I'm in I'm in JJ Kale mode right now. Oh, so, God. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a huge fan of, that's another story yeah. for another day. But uh, not a WIA artist, unfortunately. Yeah, not unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think they did the thing with Clapton, though. It was that, I can't remember who put that one out. Anyway. Uh, it, yeah. Okay, so... I think this is a success, especially that remix. The outtakes are fun stuff. The lives, I laughed. I was doing work when I played the live CD, um, and I I had a, a a laugh at. Then I played the Maxwell thing again. But mm -hmm. so what? Can you give us any hints on either the future of the replacements, or I know we have Black Friday coming. Uh, yeah. You know, in a few months. Well, and I mean, I, I again, it's, it's we okay. Uh, the there's certain records where we can't do anything. You know, I think I've, I've said it many times. I've said it in podcasts in the past that are associated with previous um, projects. Um, you know, you're not going to get a deluxe stink. You're just not because that is there. There's not enough Damn. there. You know, I, you know, they have a limited discography. Is there a larger plan that we hope to be able to pull off? Uh, of course, but again, we kind of have to take these things one at a time, you know, and I've just started kind of starting to wrap my head around what's possible for whatever the next one is going to be. Um, and you know, we got to see, we got to see what we can come up with, because I will say with Tim, you know, we did not know if we could actually do a box for Tim, mm. it was very touch and go for a, a, a few months as to whether or not it would be a box or not. Um, because we didn't know if the bonus material would be there. You know, I think it's one of the good things about working on this project was that granted it took, you know, we started work on it over 18 months ago. But for many of those months, we were able to work on it without the pressure of a looming project. So that way we could take our time with it. You hadn't announced it, right? Yeah, yeah we hadn't we hadn't scheduled it. We hadn't done we had no production work had done had been done on it. You know, I was doing rough mixes and going back and forth and just kind of talking it through uh, before actually, you know, submitting it for any kind of you know consideration or running any of the internal uh reviews that we have to do at rhino in order to get a project green lit um so you know we're working in isolation on it and without the pressure of looming deadlines really did help inform a lot of what you're hearing um in this box you know so but no i i mean there's I'm researching like like three projects right now for the band. You know, I think it's it's a matter of which one bears the most fruit will be the one that comes next, if we can pull it off. 
So I think that, you know, sure, there's a 40th anniversary of Let It Be next year. I'm I'm well aware of that. I'm sure but you there, But there's no guarantee. I, I, will, I will point blank tell you, there is no guarantee that there will be a Let It Be box. There's no guarantee. Will there be a Get yes. Back box? <laughs> <laughs> well, let it be get back no more. oh yeah yeah no um that but, was a but it's, joke. um but no, not. There, there is there is no there is no guarantee that there will be a let it be box i will tell you right now yeah. because so far what research has been done it's you know it's not it's not immediately apparent that it's going to happen that you is. know i think that i it's it's way too soon for me to even hint that that would be the next one because there 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 really is no guarantee now aren't they announcing there by the time this is up aren't they announcing a record store day releases uh on black friday yes yes by the time, if, if this project? goes up on tuesday morning this is then, this yeah, is yeah. you're watching this tuesday morning. you're watching on tuesday. Tuesday, this everyone. is october 2nd october um, 2nd it would be october 3rd October 3rd. Yeah, it'd be October 3rd. Okay. Um, yeah, so by the time that this is uh, right, October 3rd. Premiered, um, yeah, the, the record store day list should be out. Now, if this video, <laughs> if the list is delayed, you will not see this portion of this no. video. No. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's, I'll wait there's till I burn. get a confirmation from you and I will reach out to you Tuesday, right. today. If this is today. <laughs> if this is not today, this is Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> Good. So you're um, watching this. The list is out already. If you're, yeah, if you're yeah, not yeah. watching this, yeah, yeah, I promise. Um, but there's, um, you know, there's a number of projects that I've worked on that are coming out for Black Friday uh, on in November of uh, 2023. You know, there's no there's no replacements projects, uh, but there's. Um, You'll be happy because we're doing a breakout of the Manchester show from the Waiting for Columbus box as a three LP set. That's a little feat for those. Yeah, of that's you. a little. That's a little feat uh, release. Uh, it looks great. It sounds great. We had to we had to alter the track order a little bit just to accommodate for side breaks that are not <laughs> super long um so it's it's a little bit of a reconfiguration of the of the track order but it still plays really really nicely and we didn't delete any tracks we just kind of had to move some stuff around is it a we double mainly, you just... mainly triple oh, two. yeah it's a triple lp um there's that uh there's another captain beefheart uh reissue that i've done it's for Shiny Beast Bat Chain Puller. It is a two LP set. So you have you did uh, Clear Spot, right? I did Clear Spot, and I did the I'm gonna do what I want to do, the live show from my father's place oh. uh, that came out. So there's yeah, Shiny Beast. Uh, there's it's the original album, Triple A, uh, cut by Chris Bellman. Second LP is uh, completely previously unreleased. It's demos uh from 1977 after they were signed back to warner brothers um you know stuff that is circulated on like fifth gen cassettes um we have you know we have the original masters for it there's rough mix there's uh previously unreleased you know there's you know they're doing stuff like brick bats and um run paint run um during those sessions so you're hearing you know th that band play those songs uh before they were ultimately recorded for dock at the radar station so you know definitely keep an eye out for that one that one's really special that one's super special and um I'm trying to think of what else i have um those are the two main ones okay that, that, yeah, that works. Those, those are the two main ones. Those are two I like, so that's all I care about. Hey, there you go. Not as yeah, no picture disc for me personally, but you know that's fine. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to end this. I tell you, I want to thank Jason. I want to thank you, Jason. Uh, sure. I mean, I'm a. I realized, you know, when I was going through my list, I used to have, and I don't know what happened to it because I ca carefully take care of my records. I need to. Re I don't have Hootenanny, so 
you know. Oh wow. You no, know, I will uh, take care of that. You but thank you for watching. Gouge. Yes. Yeah. Nanny. Yeah, I, I, that's I would, my, that's my favorite replacement. Is it? Is it? Okay. Yeah. My favorite is uh, let it be, but Tim is a close second. So it's yeah. weird. Oh, and Hootenanny is probably one where a box set doesn't look like yeah, that. I, I would. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, Even though there was a rumor that they recorded something like 40 songs for that record. Um, so far, any kind of research into it has not yielded that. However, you know, it's, again, it's like, until you know all of the bounty kind of presents itself we kind of don't know where we're gonna go next you know of course we have wish lists and stuff like that but it's ultimately you know it's up to I, what I what that. will what will best serve their legacy and also best serve the high bar that we've established with these boxes of which you know the reception for the tim box has been overwhelmingly positive to have you know a five-star review in mojo to be uncuts reissue of the month to have amazing reviews in the new yorker the new york times and variety and also to have a perfect 10 and best new reissue from pitchfork the only 10 that they have given out this year jason now you're bragging now yeah. you're bragging i did read the new yorker or the new york times article i saw the pitch yeah, yeah. I mean, those those guys at, and women at Pitchfork, they, you know, there's some great records. They'll give you a five or something. So sure. good for you. Congratulations. Yeah. On this and all the stuff. Thank you very you're much. Up. And thank you for hanging out and chatting. Uh, hopefully well, we'll and well. Ult ultimately, you know, the, the most major thanks go to Bob Mayer, yeah. Ed Stasium, Justin Perkins, the band's management, and the band themselves. Yeah. And to Tommy Ramon. Yeah. As well. Because we wouldn't have this great me remix if he had not captured that magic on tape. And Rhino Records, you know, I mean, as much and as Rhino as well. Yes. You know, yeah. I, Rhino Records, they started out like this in Westwood and look where they are now. So yep. um, thanks for watching, everyone. And uh, it is now Wednesday or Tuesday, but you you know before we do. So thanks for watching. Awesome. Yeah.